from that, but certainly we're going to we're going to continue to cover that as we get breaking news. Having said that, Rachel, tell me the strange that the family happened to know that the backpack and the notebook and partial remains were there at that path. Does that change any when you learn that that area had been underwater for approximately a month? The water had just receded. They were interviewed earlier, they being individuals there, law enforcement involved in this, to say that there were water moccasins, there were alligators. It was pretty deep water that was covering this area. To me, it's still strange that they knew where their son was. Uh, he, if he had indeed killed Gabby Petito and then came home and then told his parents where he was going to go, it, it just that amount of information that he may have given, including his whereabouts, is strange to me. I, I it. it we don't know if it was a suicide, but signs point that it may have been. And I, I really do find that level of information, if, if he was going to go out and harm himself, that his parents knew where the location would be, is odd. Or, you know, I also, I also think maybe they knew where he was going and then they never heard from him and they thought, we're surprised we haven't heard from him. Now we're going to tell the FBI, you need to look for him because we think something happened to him. And as soon as those waters receded, they said, we're going to where we know he was. And sure enough, then he was found. Who knows? It's all speculation because the facts are we don't know yet. But the other thing that people found strange throughout the duration of this case is that Brian Laundrie's family was not speaking to law enforcement. They were not cooperating. And their attorney, their family attorney, came out and said, you know, they're not talking because I've told them not to talk. Let's also look together at what he said once they learned that Brian Laundrie was identified, the partial human remains. The family attorney made a statement and said, Chris and Roberta Laundrie have been informed that the remains found yesterday in the reserve are indeed Brian's. We have no further comment at this time, and we ask that you respect the laundry's privacy at this time. Stephen Bordellino. Now, that statement's not that much different than all the other statements, which is they're not going to say anything. I've told them not to say anything. And I think the frustration for all has been here you have a family that knows something. They know something. They know some detail that could help law enforcement. We don't know how much. We don't know what their son Brian did or didn't tell them. But I can promise you they knew something when he came back in a vehicle to their home without Gabby Petito after he'd been traveling the country with his fiance Gabby. And I think the frustration is that although they don't have to say anything, the appearance is because they haven't said anything, they know a whole lot more than they've let on. I agree that's the frustration and the fact that they then once they did decide to say anything basically took them to where he was eventually found is is it makes it look like they were hiding him and then maybe they became very nervous themselves and decided to help and to have everybody together so it it's a this is a strange case. This is definitely strange and it I it looks like they do more do no more than they have been letting on. Right. And I would agree with you that we don't know everything. It's a strange case. A lot more, I promise, is going to come out, right? I can almost assure you there's going to be a lot more information. But I think mm -hmm. the other thing, every de criminal defense attorney says, don't talk to the police. If they want to talk to you, don't. Don't interview with them. Don't talk to them. So it's not surprising when someone says, I'm not going to talk to you, law enforcement. But when you have a missing person, I think then people assume, presume, they're not talking because they know something, and that something isn't good. That something is a crime, and sure enough, we know in this case, although there are no named suspects at all, Gabby Petito was, in fact, strangled. One of the little strange pieces of evidence, the police did subpoena records, and there were some text messages I want to talk about, and I think that we can pull them up on the screen, because these are text messages. This is from a subpoena, and the, the concern or, or belief is that the family of Gabby Petito didn't believe the text message that they last 
received because of the way that she referred to the grandfather. Can you help Stan? And Stan is the grandfather. I keep getting his voicemails. And what they said was it was referring to grandfather, but that the she never called him Stan. And so the mother got concerned. And that to me is a telltale sign that that text didn't come from her. Because I, you know, all of the people that are around us that we know, when they call someone by a different name, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem right. And again, I think there's a natural reaction to think, all right, somebody else wrote that text. But these are the things, do you agree with me, Rachel, that law enforcement, uh, they know a lot more than we know, and we don't know it yet on purpose. Because guess what? It's an ongoing investigation, and they shouldn't disclose details of an ongoing investigation that might help them solve this crime. Absolutely. They're definitely keeping a lot of the details from the public intentionally. And my guess is they're now investigating uh, Brian Laundrie's parents uh, as well. So they're going to continue to keep this investigation under wraps, even though it may look like on its surface he killed her, he he forged her text messages, and then he killed himself or what met his demise somewhere in that park. But that does not, I do not think at this point the investigation is ending there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Let's listen a little bit because the FBI came out very quickly after they were looking in the park and found some items to tell us what the current news was. Let's listen to that together. As you're aware, the FBI and the Northport Police Department and our state and local law enforcement partners have been searching the area of the Carlton Reserve for Brian Laundry, a person of interest in the murder of Gabby Petito. Earlier today, investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundry. These items were found in an area that up until recently have been underwater. Our evidence response team is on scene using all available forensic resources to process the area. It's likely the team will be on scene for several days. I know you have a lot of questions, but we don't have all the answers yet. We are working diligently to get those answers for you. We are grateful for the dedication and professionalism of the Northport Police Department, along with our partners from the state and local agencies. Complex investigations such as this cannot be accomplished by one agency alone, but there are just too many agencies to name them all here today. Portions of the Mayakahatchee Creek Environment Park and Carlton Reserve will remain closed to the public until further notice. This is an active and ongoing investigation, so we ask the public to maintain distance from any law enforcement personnel, equipment, vehicles, and other related activity for the safety of the public and to protect the integrity of our work. We have no additional comment related to today's activities. And again, just to the point, Rachel, I believe law enforcement has revealed as much as they're able to. Keeping in mind, this is an open investigation. We do not know who is going to be accused of committing this crime of strangulation of Gabby Petito. Certainly, Court TV will begin and continue to bring any breaking news to you. Up next, we want to talk about a major trial that starts November 1st, and that is Kyle Rittenhouse. You may have seen video of him with a semi-automatic weapon shooting in protest. We're going to bring you more of that up next here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. In all the years that I've covered trials across this country, this one is the most divisive. Kyle Rittenhouse awaiting trial. Chaos erupted in Kenosha overnight. Who shot three people in Kenosha, Wisconsin during the riots. Two of them died. Rittenhouse has pled not guilty to murder and all charges stemming from the incident. Kyle Rittenhouse thinks he's above the law. He was an active shooter and he tried to flee. He's the one who went down armed with an assault rifle, armed with a rifle that was almost half the size of his body, which is crazy. The issue really will become, was he justified in using lethal force in defending himself? Who struck my client first? Who attacked? my client first. I've never seen anything like it before here on Court TV, ever.
The trial for 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is set to begin November 1st. And this Sunday, Court TV takes a closer look at the case and what happened in late August of 2020. Within hours of the shootings in Kenosha, Wisconsin, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse became a political lightning rod. And his case took on a life of its own on social media. So when Kyle Rittenhouse and his mother went to Pudgy's Pub after his formal arraignment, it didn't take long for the photos to go viral. I assume then at this point you're going to be entering pleas? Yes, prepared to enter not guilty pleas to all the charges contained therein. In early January 2021, Kyle Rittenhouse was formally arraigned and charged with the murders of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, as well as the attempted murder of Gage Grosskreutz. Just hours after that court appearance, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was out on bail, ended up at a place called Pudgy's Pub. So after his arraignment, Kyle Rittenhouse and his mom go to Pudgy's Pub. And yeah, he's not 21, but if you're there with your mom, you're allowed to drink, so he's drinking. Christine, can I dispatch? Hi, you guys, are, you guys are looking at a problem. And there is a post online with a picture of Kyle Rittenhouse at Pudgy's on the 5th. So in this bar, he's having a few drinks, and he's wearing a T-shirt that says, free as f People start wanting to come talk to him. He starts taking pictures with folks who turn out to be white supremacists. So this just looked so bad. Technically, he wasn't breaking any laws, but it looked awful. And optics matter. Prosecutors wound up learning about this incident, and then they motioned the court to modify his bail. This was not a random uh, crossing of paths here in a random bar at a random time where they just happened upon one another. Uh, this was something that was uh, coordinated. They go back into court, they want to get those pictures admitted, and they also want to raise his bail. This is something where uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, intended to be there, these other individuals intended to be there. Uh, and the Proud Boys organization is relevant to this case because we have to put the incident uh, of August 25th in context. We have downloaded Mr. Rittenhouse's cellular phone. We have an expert review that phone. That expert has done an analysis to try to determine if there is anything on that phone related to Proud Boys, militia, white nationalists, Boogaloo Boys, KKK, three percenters. And the finding was the extraction does not establish that the user belonged to or even had any interest in any malicious style organizations. It is an unfortunate fact that this case has become um, a surrogate for a, a lot of emotional reaction that has nothing to do or little to do or nothing to do with the issues in the case. And for me to let that in as evidence of a motive that existed four months earlier, can't see it. Absolutely not. You do not want to miss Court TV's in-depth special report, Chaos in Kenosha, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, this Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We also want to take this opportunity to tell you about our next live trial starting next week here on Court TV. Jury selection begins Monday in the state of Florida for the murder trial of Keith Johansson. Johansson is accused of shooting and killing his wife while the couple's six-year-old son was at home. Johansson called 911 on April 7th of 2018 to report that his wife had been shot. He told police when the police arrived that he heard gunshots. We're going to have more on this story as we continue to cover it and cover it in trial next week on Court TV. Good Friday afternoon. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ashley Wilcott. This afternoon, we are following developments in cases with high-profile defendants. Bob, did you love Kathy? Yes, very much. Robert Durst has been formally charged with murder and the death of his missing wife, Kathy. Will his conviction in Susan Berman's killing mean a slam dunk for the new prosecution? 
And the massive manhunt is over. The FBI confirms that the human remains found in Florida belong to Brian Laundry. We'll look at the most telling evidence in the deaths of him and his fiancée, Gabby Petito. Plus, how did Alec Baldwin accidentally kill a cinematographer? The actor is now speaking about the shooting. But first, new developments with Robert Durst, the millionaire who has been a convicted murderer because of the death of Susan Berman, has now been charged with the death of his former wife, Kathy Durst. Now remember, Kathy Durst vanished back in 1982. Her body has never been found. She's never been heard from. And now he's charged with her murder as a convicted murderer. Still with us, trial attorney Rachel Fizet. Rachel, convicted murderer, sentence of life, in jail, in his 70s, in sick, allegedly, I think it was his attorney actually, so probably not, allegedly had COVID-19. He has other health problems that he had through the duration of the trial. Now charged with the death of his wife, Kathy Durst. What's your initial reaction to that news? My reaction is this gives some relief to the family in what has been, in their minds, probably a long overdue charge. I think the conviction of Susan Berman, there was a lot of evidence discussing Kathy Durst in that trial. So now they are just following the conviction to the logical next conclusion. I realize he's already in jail, uh, in prison for a lifetime, but would, for sure, but it doesn't change the fact that this case can still be solved through a trial. And, you know, there was a lot of talk during the trial, five months of trial for the death of Susan Berman. And in that trial, the prosecutor, John Lewin, went and attacked all three of the dead bodies and said Robert Durst did all of them. So he did accuse Kathy Durst, who is now been charged with her murder. And in Galveston, Texas, there was the body of Morris Black, his neighbor, who was also dismembered. And actually, Robert Durst was accused of that murder, but was acquitted. He's been convicted of Susan Berman. So he has been acquitted in one case. He's been convicted in another case. And now the third case of Kathy Durst. Do you believe that they have more evidence that we heard about during the Susan Berman trial? I do. I believe they have a bit more evidence. I think the conviction of Susan Berman is evidence in and of itself, since I believe the motive was to hide the Kathy Durst murder, um, in, in part at least. And we also have his confession on tape, which you, I killed them all. I mean, that's, that's a big confession that I'm sure they will then show. So this trial may look a fair amount like the last trial to some degree, but um, I think once you have a convicted murderer, the jury, is more likely to convict him again. And Rachel, do you think that was a confession that we heard? And let's just a reminder, the jinx, and he was off air, but he was still mic'd up. He goes to the restroom and you can hear him talking. And that was evidence presented at the murder trial of Susan Berman. Was it a confession in your mind? Was it an official confession? No, but he, he didn't think anybody was listening. I, it, the jury has to weigh the credibility of that confession, but I really think it helps the prosecution. And one thing they did in this case, we both know, is they presented every shred of evidence. These prosecutors lived this case, prepped this case, and I believe everything they had about Robert Dersh, they threw at him at this trial, so much so that there was some discussion at the end of five months. Are they really going to convict Robert Dersh, or rather, will they feel some empathy, empathy, and feel like it was too much of the kitchen sink and acquit him? Well, we know the answer, conviction. Crystal ball, if you were to pull yours out right now, and I like to put our guests on the spot simply to get your expertise, knowing what you know about Kathy Durst's disappearance, the evidence presented at the murder trial of Susan Berman, would you expect that we might see a conviction of Robert Durst for the murder of his wife, Kathy Durst? I would. I, I, I would say yes. 
Tell me more. Tell me, do you think in this case, and another part of this is the family. Kathy Durst's family has been very outspoken. They have wanted answers. They have sought justice. They wanted to be heard at the sentencing hearing involving the conviction for the murder of Susan Berman, which was not allowed. And in fact, they've made a statement. Robert Durst has now been formally charged with the murder of Kathleen McCormick Durst. We are very happy with this development. At this time, however, we will not be making any further comments until the grand jury process is completed. Why do you think that Kathy Durr's family is not wanting to say anything else until the legal grand jury process wraps up? They don't want to in any way mess with the case. They want the case to proceed as law enforcement and the prosecutors want it to proceed. So they don't want to take any risk in tainting any member of the jury or in any way doing a misstep. They have waited for this moment, my guess is for almost 40 years. And they are finally getting their moment that they've known. And, and one of the reasons I was looking into my crystal ball is that in domestic violence cases, I believe members of the family often know what the possible outcome was in these kinds of cases. And her family appears to believe that Robert Durst was her killer. So they are sighing some relief at this point. He's now a convicted murderer. He has you know, a confession or something very strange on videotape. I think they are feeling good about where this is headed and they do not in any way want to disrupt the process. Yeah, and Rachel, you made an excellent point, which is they were involved intimately in terms of her marriage to Robert Durst, domestic violence. And so they know details about what that life was like for Kathy Durst. All right, let's take a look together at the murder trial of Robert Durst. 